I'm Julie Ristow here with the Bay Street Project. I uh, help run the operations there and I'm on the leadership team. There's a crew of us here today. My colleague Will Crumby, who's the communications director and also another um, colleague has just welcomed with Neil Ritchie, so if you have questions, you can also talk with him. Um, we're here to tell you about our perennial poultry regenerative model uh, that's right now located uh, near Northfield, Minnesota, which most of you know where that is. Uh, so we're gonna just do a little bit of an overview of what the model looks like and sort the whole kind of system application of it and how it can be replicated. And that's my job, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Will to talk specifically about one of the food crops that we've been working with in the last five years, which is garlic. So you'll get to hear kind of the garlic story of Main Street Project, and I know there's another garlic story that's coming up after this here in the same room. So you could be here all afternoon talking about garlic. <clears throat> Anyway, so um, we always start with this slide because this is the best representation. Uh, again, Main Street Project emerged maybe about nine years ago. Uh, it's gone through a lot of evolution, but really the focus of the project to begin with was how do we keep wealth in our communities? How do we support every aspect of our community? We worked a lot with immigrant communities, which we still do, focus a lot on Latinos. And the whole idea of, you know, what does it take to keep up in the community, of course, we think starts with agriculture and food. And so a lot of our conversations at that time, way back in 2007 and 8, were focused on what would it look like if we actually could create a model of food production here that would keep wealth here, be accessible to many people, be replicable, and help change the system that was just kind of crunching us. So this is a picture of that model that I'm talking about, the perennial and poultry. And uh, you will notice here uh, what we call the paddock. So our paddocks are one and a half acres. Our coops can hold up to 1,500 birds and they're stationary. And here you can see the whole paddock that the chickens rotate on one side and then go to the other side about every 10 days. Really at the center of this whole thing is a different way of feeding our chickens. So obviously they're outside, but we also rely a lot on sprouts and the sprout mixture. And this is just a great picture of our existing, one of our existing um, facilities. So last year we had egg layers in there. One of the things about Main Street Projects that does a lot of research and development. Uh, and here we were testing to see how does this model work with egg layers. So that's a picture of our paddock and facility. Close up here are chickens, the mighty uh, Freedom Ranger chicken, um, and they're great chickens for us because they actually get outside and move around and they want to range, they want to move. So you can tell that by this chicken. And here's also just a close up of the sprouts. So as the uh, chickens go out into the, into the one side of the paddock, we're, we're throwing sprouts or the seeds on the other side. These, this is about a perfect um, <clears throat> height for the sprouts and when we like to get those chickens out there, the nutritional value of the sprouts is amazing the way in which it feels the soil is amazing. So this is just a nice little close up. And in back there you see when we talk about perennials, uh, we work primarily with hazelnuts in the paddocks and elderberries. And so that's um, in the background there you see an example of a mature um, hazelnut. And so people usually ask at this time, and most of you probably wouldn't have to, but when I'm speaking in front of audiences that don't know a lot, they'll say, well, do the chickens eat the hazelnuts? They do not eat the hazelnuts. Um, but they sure like to get underneath them and scratch and move around and fertilize those hazelnuts. So one of the things about this model is the synergistic quality of it is that the chicken's manure is the golden magic for these perennials and that the yields of the perennials then, of course, respond to that manure. So all the way around, this is a um, model that's very synergistic in energy connecting. So we always like to talk about this because the whole, our whole model and the way in which we work is really predicated on these three aspects. A lot of people call this the triple bottom line. Uh, the social, economic, and ecological aspects. At Main Street Project we always start with the social first because we feel as though there's a lot of efforts that can say, well we are economic and we're trying to save the environment that the people don't really matter. And so everything you see about this has that social aspect up front to say, does this work for the farmer? Does it work for the community? 
Is it profitable? Is it something the farmer can do? This is a big question we have. Um, and so as we're making transitions into another kind of economy or a sustainable farming practice and practices, we always start there. You know, our model is, uh, we think, very profitable. We're happy to share those figures with you. Uh, and on the ecological side, um, it's obvious that we're working with perennials. Perennials have amazing root systems to help restore <coughs> our land and our soil. Overall, and I'll show you this soon, we are also building a demonstration farm that shows this whole model of the chicken perennials sort of nested in other crops that are perennial crops. So we think all three of those are important, and so we say this is what we start with in mind when we move forward. And the other thing that we are really um, grounded in is a sense of community and the aspects of what real wealth staying in real communities means to all of us. And so this is just an image that we love because you know, in two years, look at the difference here, and how. And this is the uh, image of a uh, two-acre place where we actually do some of our R and D, and just the hope of looking at these different varieties and how they're evolving. Many, many people come to our farm, and the, especially this parcel. And so we always talk about, you know, a lot of what we need to start with is the hope and the and the actual, um, you know, imagination that things can be different. I'm going to put our, um, the visionary kind of behind the actual model itself is Rand Nottle Haslick Marquin, who is uh, one of the founders of this whole effort. And he's not here today, but I always like to bring him into the room because part of what's unique about this is that it has a real indigenous aspect to it. He's from Guatemala. He was trained up as a scientist, Guatemalan soil scientist person. He's got a lot of um, power in that space. And in one minute, he can explain this better than I could in 10. So I'm going to put him in the room with a video. I am Reginaldo Haslin Marroquin. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Main Street Project in Minnesota. Back in 2006, uh, we came to a realization that in order to change things at a large scale in the conditions of the immigrant communities, especially those from Latin America that currently support this illusion that there is such thing as cheap food, we had to engage something at a large scale. So what we said was, what if we were able to redesign the way we grow poultry? So we came up with this idea where we established perennial crops and created a canopy, which is natural to the evolutionary process of poultry, and incorporated native species to that canopy. And then we worked with the understory to create conditions where poultry will grow healthy and will give us good quality products. The end result is a much healthier soil. We restored that soil at the same time that we are restoring the capacity of these families to participate in this large scale system under a whole new system set of conditions. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to leave us with this thought. Small scale farming, that's what we're here talking about. Large scale impact. And that's about the ability to replicate and scale up this model. From the beginning it was designed as a systems changer and so we're really focused in a region right now to bring that to bear to encourage other farmers to build this model. So. Some of the building blocks I've already talked about, you know, close-ups of, of course, our chickens, um, the hazelnuts, this is what it looks like under the canopy, some of the sprouts coming up, our farmers in the middle, paddock up there, and then an example of some of the annuals that we do work with our sunflowers and corn. And, you know, we kind of like just to show this mosaic of all the different images of the different aspects of what we're doing. And another close-up of the actual <clears throat> perennial poultry model itself, the regenerative model. So Will's, Will's our photographer, and he makes chickens look incredible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they are. You can have that on a cart. Yeah. This is uh, just a little bit of a map of where we are located in the, in the state of Minnesota. We're focused primarily in southeast Minnesota right now as our region. Uh, there's a number of reasons for that. One is its proximity to, of course, uh, the metropolitan areas. We were starting early on to think about markets. But probably more important is that there's a lot of small-scale agriculture already in place in the southeast, and the, the landscape is real conducive to this kind of um, agriculture. 
I come from right here. That's where my family farm is and where I was farming actively for many years, and the landscape's totally different. Most average scale farm size there is 2,500 acres. Here in the southeast, you can still find, you know, farmers that are farming 400 acres, 200 acres, you know, that kind of thing. So certainly that had something to do with it, but the landscape that we're working with right now, which I'll show you in a minute on our um, newly acquired farm, is what is typically called marginal land, which means kind of shorthand for it's land that all got tiled and drained a long time ago, uh, beginning as early as 1910, 1915. A lot of it was wetland, and as that land, you know, began to work with the unnatural force of the tile, there's been a lot of erosion in some parts of it. Um, we, are, we bought a farm that had 100 acres. Uh, 70 of it was tillable. Um, and of that tillable acreage, probably 20 acres shouldn't have been tilled at all. You know? And so it's been corn on corn on corn. So it was a really interesting parcel to get a hold of and to actually work with. Here's the Main Street Project farm was acquired um, about eight months ago now, with the idea of having a central place for our farmers to congregate and learn, and it's a demonstration farm, it's a research and development farm. Um, certainly, um, we bought it because we, we were paying to restore it. <laughs> we wanted to show the aspects of wetland restoration and pond uh, restoration there, and the soil is really great for perennials, you can see this is a hill here that's recently been planted to hazelnuts. The darker area back there is a, a little spot, it's about three acres, that really wants to be a wetland or a pond. In the back there with the dark green, you're going to see where our coops are going. So this is you know, a great example of the kind of land I was talking about. This land actually uh, used to be called the Greenvale Sloop. And it had a lot of acres. You know, if you put a drone up and you look at it, you can see the kind of land that we're talking about. And this is the, the design. I just thought you'd like to see sort of what you know Will's going to kind of be adding into this now. If you can start to picture, uh, this is 70 acres total tillable. Tillable over here we have uh, rim reinvested in Minnesota land. I wanted to show this <clears throat> so you can see how we're working, of course, with the contours of the land. Uh, everything you see, this is our large field here. This will be hazelnuts and elderberries. And here's how we're, we're putting together these coops. So that's six of the, that first picture I showed you, the stationary coop with the one and a half acres, organized together like this. This is what we're you know, working with to, to lay out now and how is that gonna, you know, we're thinking about the machinery and the flow and all that. The entrance is here with the community pond and that hill I just showed you is here. So this is meant over time to be um, a legacy farm that's really demonstrating this, this whole thing to anybody who wants to come and visit. We do have research partners. It's reliant on partnerships and community. We recently had a big community outreach um, effort where we are actively working with Latino uh, families, multi-dimensional and multi generational families to come out. That a little um, piece that I showed you around the growing hope, that's up there. You can kind of see that little, we call it the annex. So, so I thought it'd be good for you to see what we're working with here. Um, the one thing that kind of cut off here, I want to just showcase a few of the things that we say are very important, is the pieces of the puzzle that are huge barriers. Uh, for farmers to be able to make this transition. It's part of what Main Street Project's work is, is to create the conditions so people can push through those barriers. So we all know the importance of research and development, particularly for this kind of thing. Um, university's been really important over the years with uh, different kinds of varieties of hazelnuts, elderberries, and all that. Part of our research is really about replicability, ease of planting, how are things working in different locations? What's going to work best in our paddocks? All of that kind of thing. So, um, and with the farm where it's located, uh, this also has a huge dimension of uh, water research and development. Now it butts up against the Cannon. Um, well, this is a. It's called Mud Creek, but eventually it runs into the Cannon River. So there's also a lot of water R&D that's occurring down here now. 
So research and development is one aspect. One of the things that has been is pretty amazing, and I would say we're <clears throat> working hard towards growing it quickly and efficiently and also with the right standards, is plant material. It's really hard for farmers to get a hold of plant material. And when they do, it's too expensive. It's just too expensive to move forward. So what our team's been doing, with the help of other farmers in the area, is to begin to build perennial nurseries that are commons-based so that we can actually get the plant material moving. And as farmers want to make a transition, say they want to plant, 20 acres of hazelnuts or have that capacity, maybe they can come to us for some of that plant material, which will help make that transition easier. Um, you can see here close up what it looks like when we uh, was coppicing and putting elderberries into the ground. This is a bare root of our hazelnuts and what it looked like when we planted hazelnuts uh, at the farm last year. We put in about 9,000 hazelnuts at the central farm. So the idea of getting a hold of plant material as well as a community aspect, which we've talked about, you cannot do this. It's very hard to do this kind of farming individually and by yourself. Um, and so the support systems that are needed, the community that gets built is all, of course, part of the wealth that's being generated and we feel strongly about. And this kind of shows the whole system. And I want to point out, especially in this corner, another big aspect of um, our whole work is trying to find the right financing partners that can make it possible for farmers to get the kind of financing they need in a perennial ecology and a perennial economy. And so we all know that farmers are very driven often by a mono cropping system that has at the core of it a yearly cash flow <laughs> reality. So we're trying to find mechanisms and partners that will help to make it possible for a farmer to plant something and wait for five years to get something back. Um, so you can hear about that in all sorts of ways, patient capital, slow money, those are kind of big brands, but really what we're doing <laughs> is we're building a um, financing partnership with two entities that we can rely on. One is Iroquois Valley Farms. You've probably seen them as a sponsor here. They helped us finance our farm. They have absolutely really good farmer-centered conditions and terms for their money. And the other financing partner that we're work, beginning to work with now is a Shared Capital Cooperative, which um, also has that kind of generosity and it knows what it means to actually move forward in a perennial economy way. So I wanted to point that out. This just kind of shows the whole system. We need consumers that know about our products, cooperating farms, and I think Will's going to talk a bit about that, our financing partners, and our research and development and um, demonstration sits kind of in the middle. Got of a question for you. What's, sure, I'm going to move the, it. What's the legal form of ownership? Uh, for a farm? For the store. For our farm is an LLC that's connected to the nonprofit. So Main Street Project's a nonprofit. There's a great story there about that. We had two investor partners that came in. Uh, and so we built an LLC that includes them, Main Street Project. Main Street Project is the managing um, shareholder on that. Now I'm going to turn it over to Will to get, you know, dig in more specifically about garlic. Mm -hmm. I'll be around for any general questions as is Neil or Will. But that gives you kind of an overview that we can kind of nest the garlic in them. So, thanks. Thank you, Julie. Yeah. Julie does not like podiums. Just a little side note about her. She has to be out here. I'm more of a podium kind of person. Um, yeah, so I really like that. We, I mean, we can almost relate that to na the natural systems that we're trying to create as well. So I really like that slide because of that. Let's see what we're getting into. Okay, so how many people are here because you saw that there was maybe a little hint about garlic? <laughs> okay, so there's three or four of you that are excited about garlic. <laughs> and uh, how many people raise chickens? A lot of you raise chickens. Okay, that's great. More than 100? We got a couple, four, four or five via? Great, nice. Um, so we're talking a lot about our commons-based approach and how we can work together as farmers, right? And with Main Street Project, we realized that to take this to the next level, we need to grow a region of farmers that are interested in these types of systems and 
there's a whole lot of back end to create within that with processing and, and marketing. We all know that as farmers. So how does that relate to garlic? Well, we can use the chicken manure for fertilization and we can grow annual crops like garlic outside of our paddocks and, and, and use the manure for fertilization and just incorporate it as another means of income on our farms. So a little bit about our story with garlic. Um, you can see we use a buckwheat to prep our fields and in this next photo here, that's us spreading the manure, we're working the land and planting by hand. You see the garlic in development and then harvest, that kind of told the whole story. And that's thanks to Wilbur de la Rosa, who is our farm manager, who really knows a ton more about soil science and, and, and what's happening here. So I'll do my best to explain what I know about it. Um, so over the course of four years, so in 2014 we spent $400 on 50 pounds of garlic and this is the story of how we got to that point. Um, so here's the 50 pounds and you can see we didn't have a great year. I think there was a, a lot of mold issues or fungus issues um, that we just we just didn't understand. How do you manage garlic? What is this this thing garlic? And then we started to get a, get a hold of it and in 2016 we brought 75 pounds up to 300 pounds and then it just continued to multiply and that's the great thing about garlic, you're getting five to seven cloves for every individual clove that you get. So what we're trying to learn is how, how do we aggregate that in our farming communities, how do we bring that to a commons based approach, how do we share resources and, and build an industry around it. And What's really exciting is that the SFA is really focused on that this year, and they started the, I'm going to butcher the name, the uh, Minnesota Premium Garlic Project, I believe. Is that what it's called, Minnesota Premium Garlic? And they're going to talk after this, so I'm sure some of you are just going to roll that over and keep learning about garlic. And so in 2018, that's what we're estimating, seed quality garlic that we'll harvest, and a lot of that can go to market, but we're focused on seed quality, which What's nice is we're a nonprofit. We we seek outside funding and, and have been able to do this research and development, but anybody can apply it and it seems viable. And please excuse my uh, my ability to not quantify things appropriately, but 4,200 pounds would have just shot right off of the <laughs> screen. And uh, so if you like that one, you'll, you'll like this one. Um, so that's what we're getting at as farmers. We have to make money, right? We have to make a living. So how do we do that together with this common space approach? How do we hone in on different uh, plants and, and products like garlic? So I'm going to play you a little video. And this is a video from my farm. Regeneration Farms, and that's where we chose to uh, move our research and development to this year because we've got so much going on with our new farm that it's really hard to think about uh, managing all of this. But So we're working together there, right there. There's one instance where Main Street Project is working with another local farm and really just kind of building this web of farmers. So what you'll see here is, is what we planted this fall.
So it looks fun, right? Better than hands and knees. Yeah, Chris says that because he was he was he was on that. Uh, this is basically a trailer that I cut a hole in. It's actually an old uh, grinder mixer trailer. It was just a frame, and we we notched out the wheels and dropped it real low. Put a couple pieces of two by four on it. Put a rain gutter that I had laying by my shed for the last ten years. And just strap this thing together. I call it the Transylvania Transplanter. <laughs> and, uh, and it worked great. It's, yeah, better than kneeling down in, in the old process. So now we have this tool that I don't know how much I spent on it. Probably uh, $10 or, or something. No, wait, no, I had to pay my neighbor to weld, weld the wheels on. So a couple hundred bucks, there's a tool. We can use it in our community and uh, it just speeds up the production and that's something that you really got to figure out with if you're if you're really if you're ramping up your garlic production because before you know it if you're not selling 50 60 70 80 percent of your seed stock you're going to end up with a huge farm of garlic which is our story over the last four years um, so you see that we we inoculated the soil previous to planting so what we did there was we just Put it on the cult, put a sprayer on the cultivator, and I just built a little box to kind of hang it off of. So that's another way of being creative, being innovative. Uh, some of you are noticing the snow on the ground. Snow came a little early. This was late October, um, but rest assured, we had another three, four weeks of, of mild weather afterwards, and we did do a, a very heavy layer of straw, which. You might be concerned about the moisture level in there, especially with garlic being susceptible, garlic being susceptible to the fungus and, and the too much moisture. So I think in the spring we'll kind of take a lot of that off, which will be convenient because right next to that is going to be some vegetable production in here. So that straw will just go directly over onto the vegetable production. So. Here's where I might stumble over a little bit because, again, Wilbur, our uh, farm manager, knows a lot more about this stuff than I do, but I can make these slides available for some of you that are maybe interested. And a lot of these are, so it's a part of our managed practice, practices and they're OMRI listed or they're organic certifiable approaches. The sustain um, is uh, turkey manure. Some of you are probably familiar with the sustain brand. And that's a solution for if, if maybe you don't have access to poultry manure. Um, but we would suggest, yeah, seeking out your local farmers and maybe, maybe they're not using their manure. But if you have to pay the cost and buy it by bag, that's, that's an option as well. Let's see what else. Is, and this goes through our process. And apparently, we're missing some things just because of the transfer from Keynote. But we incorporated the manure 20 days before planting, soil preparation with disking and tilling, 15 days before planting, selecting the seed five, to five days before planting. And that's important because you don't want the seed to really dry out. So don't immediately start breaking it up and getting it ready to plant for the next season right after you harvest it because then you're just allowing it to sit there and dry out. So that's a, a helpful tip right there. Inoculating the seed, that was with the uh, Root Shield Plus, and there's, there's a, a binding agent, I think it's, um, uh, it's like a yucca, yeah that's what it is, yucca, so it just helps bind it and coat it onto the garlic. The soil inoculation and the first fertilization, sowing and coverage with straw is just a part of getting it in the ground. And then there's weed management. We use the cultivator. So after 100 day, 180 days after planting is when we perf historically performed our first cultivation. And then the second fertilization came 200 days after planting. There's another application of fungicide, another application of fertilizer, and, and, and 60 days before harvest it looks like we're cultivating again and doing some manual weeding. We've, we've, uh, we've gotten on our hands and knees definitely and done some manual weeding, but we like to avoid work. Ray, he likes to say that we're allergic to it. And usually people laugh. Uh, and, uh, and it looks like uh, 
you're, you're, you're just about ready for harvest. Now the 15 days before the, the, with the skates, should be longer than that. It's longer than that. Okay, it be thank you. Than that that. So yeah. that that must be an error, and I thought that too, but I just left it in there just to make myself look human. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the important the importance. Uh, see now here we go with the the slides screwing up, and that really grinds my gears as a graphic designer and <laughs> marketer. But you get it. Uh, so the common space approach. You're taking one bulb which has five to seven cloves. You take one clove to sustain your business. You take another uh, to grow. I mean, you're growing both of those. And then you take another clove, and maybe you seed your farmer. Maybe you planted uh, a thousand cloves, and then all of a sudden you have seven thousand cloves. Well, perhaps you give a thousand cloves to your neighbor, and then you're working in unison with your neighbors. And if you have a crop failure, failure, and they have a, a good yield, chances are however big your network is, you're not all just going to fail in one year. So garlic gives you a lot of hope in that regards where there's a lot of room to come back, to make a comeback. And then you take the rest and you sell it. Or however you want to work that math out. It's obviously um, up to your situation, but we just encourage working in a cluster of farms. And uh, just a few things to note, you know, just important uh, to know your seed varieties, the predictability, the consistency, and the affordability, and just what it looks like in the markets. Um, what your plan is for processing, planting, harvesting, and just growing your network for the aggregation, your branding, your marketing, your distribution, all of that, just working together on a common spaced approach, and, and, and business as well, and, and trying to make a profit off of this. And standardizing your methods for consistency of quality and size, and just uh, working together on, on getting the best product that you can. And the risk management, like I said, it's really in just the ability for garlic growers to bounce back if they have a bad year. But um, I guess we're, we've had sort of bad years, but again, we, we were still learning. Since we've sort of perfected our method, it's it's been, it's been all good. We haven't had too many problems. And then another side of what, what, we're, what we're trying to say is the alley cropping, incorporating perennials, agroecology approaches, organic approaches, just for overall soil health and just to really build an industry based on perennial crops. And this is uh, an aerial of what we call the annex. And let's see where the garlic is. I think. The garlic is growing in here, but you can see elderberry and, and many other annual crops and perennial crops that we have in that system. I think that, that's uh, about four or five years old. That's as old as we've been testing the garlic. Well, you want to go back to that? Sure. Also, the farm that I showed is just to the right of that, you know, so that's how close it is. Yep, yeah, conveniently the land that we were able to purchase is right next to where all of our research and development has been happening over the last seven years. But we also have other sites around the world, uh, Mexico, Guatemala, South Dakota, and, and some other regional hubs that uh, have hosted our agripreneurs. Uh, so I hope you're excited about what we got going on, excited about the potential of garlic and just working together to make it all work. And yeah, we'll open it up for questions.